Every entrepreneur dreams of overcoming all challenges to experience the sweet taste of success and to see their business soar to unrivaled heights. Affin Bank propels your business forward by offering banking without barriers and supporting your business goals. Uh, thanks for coming back again. Um, so I think I'm uh, very honoured to have this opportunity to moderate this uh, session. I think all the, uh, the speakers together with us uh, today are all the gurus in their field. Uh, so they may look young, but nowadays a young person can become a guru. Right? As long as you, as we said, uh, you know, as long as you focus on 10,000 hours, you will become an expert in uh, in uh, in uh, all the fields right so on my left uh, Jen Jen Wong uh, I think we are Facebook friends but we never met uh, physically yes. this is the first, first time, time right okay okay uh, so Jen is a founder of open mind resource I think uh, I'll, I'll just uh, invite him later to you know uh, introduce uh, what he do but I think he has 10 years of experience in uh, MarTech. Um, so yeah, um, so as I always tell our, our friends, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people think that the, the uh, digital marketing uh, is just like Facebook and everything, right? But actually, uh, it has evolved so much into MarTech, right? So nowadays, you don't uh, talk about, they don't call themselves the, the uh, you know, digital marketing now. It's all MarTech and ad techs. So that, that's where also AI and cloud and all these services are involving. So I think we need to look at the uh, grand strategy of uh, how to implement the um, you know, uh, MarTech uh, in our daily life. And uh, I think I'll, I'll invite Jen to, uh, to tell us more about him, himself and his company later. While I would like to introduce our uh, second speakers. Um, so, as a lot of you who have been on uh, TikTok uh, must have uh, watched uh, his uh, you know, short video before. Um, so, Malaysia cousin, uh, together with us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Actually, they are, they are a pair, right? They are a pair of uh, cousins. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I am my brother. Yeah, yes. yeah. He's and his brothers. Okay. But opportunity, uh, opportunity the, the seat is not enough. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, but we are from the same state. Uh, he is from Alostar and from Singatani. Oh. So yeah, I watched some of his videos, and I think he is currently one of the most uh, one of the most uh, favorite Malaysians on uh, on uh, TikTok, mm -hmm. and uh, having uh, how many fans now you have? Uh, over one million in China. Uh, one million in China. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So when you next time when we manage to uh, you know visit China when China open up again, so we must say uh, I met a Malaysia cousin. Have you watched his video uh, TikTok before, right? And uh, uh, finally with us our final panelist, uh, but not least um, CK. Uh, you know I purposely wear his uh, white shirt, uh, off white shirt today, right to. Because I'm, I'm, I, as a moderator, I need to promote, right? Okay, to promote all my uh, uh, speakers. Um, so, Oxwhite, so he's a founder of Oxwhite, um, started with uh, non iron white shirts, but now moving into all other apparels as well, and uh, very, very popular. Uh, I think he has managed to raise uh, 5 million in ECF, more than 5, right? Uh, but but when, uh, when a few years ago, it was a record. Like one of the largest uh, equity crop fund uh, record uh, uh, in Malaysia. But now I think uh, reason the, the record has been broken by Ganesh through uh, Commerce.Asia with uh, 20 million. So it, it also show that, uh, that that was a few years ago, three years ago, four years ago. Two, two years. Two years ago. It means that we, our, our size of our economy has grown so much, right? Okay. Um, so I think we want to talk to them about how they grew their business and the kind of challenge they've been through. 
you know, and then how do they, uh, you know, uh, maintain their business and facing new challenges. I, for example, I think most of us have discussed about nowadays uh, staff uh, shortage, uh, you know, retention, and that's all the major issue. How do you uh, cope with that? And also, I think uh, I would like to use some of the things that happened uh, recently, like everyone just watched uh, yesterday the Oscar, the uh, so called um, violence. So I think it's important as an entrepreneur as well how to maintain your psychological health maintain your coolness, maintain your you know, uh, ability to deal with all the pressure. I think that's also one of the key reasons why they are standing tall today uh, with us. So uh, let me start by inviting uh, Jen. Maybe you want to introduce a bit of your business, although you are famous already. No, 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 <laughs> okay. not at all. Not um, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, just um, run us through a bit of uh, you know, how you started the business and uh, uh, scale it and, and the kind of challenge. Sure, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Very nice to be here in a physical space, a physical event. For the past two years, it's all about speaking to the screen. Felt a bit lonely in my room just talking to Zoom, you know. I'm sure many of you can relate to that, right? It's not just me. Okay, I see hands up. Excellent. So I come from a company called Open Minds. We are a MarTech consultancy firm based in Malaysia, Singapore, and in Hong Kong. Uh, we serve clients from all over the world, from Germany to Austria to Mexico, even in Russia. So that kind of affects us a little bit as well. Uh, but what we do is we help clients really figure out how can they bring whatever they're doing marketing to merge with the world of technology. How can you use technology to enhance some of these things through data analytics, through the usage of apps, through integration, through automation, through AI. And that's where our company helps clients to basically create a blueprint in making that uh, happen. This year, we celebrate our 10th year anniversary, being a bootstrap company based in Malaysia. That's something that we are very proud on. Uh, at one point of time, through our growth, we were also based in Kazakhstan for about two to three years. That was a very interesting experience. And I think for us at Open Minds, we've always been very passionate in helping companies merge marketing and technology. You know, 10 years ago, we were in an industry where in companies, marketing and technology teams sit in two separate corners in a room. They rarely interact. You speak to a marketing guy, they'll say, don't talk to me about tech. You speak to a tech guy, they don't want to listen to anything about business. But we have always been the middle person trying to merge these two people. And in the past 10 years, we have seen how the industry have changed, the perception have changed, more and more people being aware of the importance. And we are very happy to be one of the bridges to help companies uh, do that. That's why in the recent years, we also launched something called the Open Academy that not only helps companies figure out how to do this on their own internally without hiring consultants like us or even subscribe to the app and learn it on your own for free. So <laughs> some of my colleagues of Open Academy are also here. I think you probably speak to them uh, earlier, but that's, uh, I wouldn't hold up more time and pass the time to my fellow <laughs> panels as well. Thank you. Thank you. Edison. Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, very good afternoon to all of you. It's a very good opportunity for me to share some of my key journey and some milestone. Uh, we started very humble beginning since um, June of 2020. So it's, it's, I'm kind of like a child in between of them because we just started within two years. But uh, in, in these two years, we, we managed to, to, to see a lot of challenges because first of all, uh, my business is in the tourism industry. So after the MCO have hit it so, uh, us uh, so hardly and also I think most of us in here, and then we managed to do some pivot in our life. So we managed to, uh, to, to seek for opportunity, how we can continue to promote Malaysia to China because previously our, our business is more on China side. So after that, we found out um, this, industry, uh, this platform is called TikTok. In China, we call Douyin. There's a, a daily user up to, I think, six, Six, six hundred, six billion. I think six hundred million uh, daily user now today. So we saw a big opportunity in there. So we decide to use the short video for uh, the format to promote Malaysia to the, uh, that kind of uh, this platform. 
So in one year, I think after one year, 2021, so we managed to get a 1 million uh, user. So on 8th of August last year, so we managed to make the, our first live stream in China. So our main customer is more China, uh, China customer. So we managed to make around 600, uh, 600K renminbi in just two hours sales. So it's all about Malaysia's product. So this is our main intention. Our main objective is to promote Malaysia culture, Malaysia tourism, Malaysia products to China market. So in between this progress, we managed to learn a lot of um, how to make the content because we are committing with the other China um, KOL, China company. They are more far away than us. So we are, it's like we are alone in the Malaysian market, but we are doing the China market. So it's very hard and very competitive for us in this industry. So every day we have to, to learn. If, if we, we don't learn and then we will like lack off many, many, many days. So every three months they will have a new, new way of how they are doing their life. It's unlike the Malaysian market, it's like kind of passive. If, the, if they do the live stream, maybe the same way they can use, use it for one year or two years. But in China, every three months, they will change the, the way they are doing the marketing. So it's kind of ch ch challenges for us. So up to date, we also, we, we, from that, we try to using the same way how we managed to make our account into one million. So we managed to make another account. It's called um, Nyonya account. I think it's the first, first and the only account in China we are trying to promote the Nyonya culture of Malaysia. So within two months, we managed to get 500K of follower. It's mainly all China, um, China audience. So out of that, we have 94% of female audience. And then the age is from 20, 24 to 30. So from this process, we managed to learn a lot how we can really make content. We believe that the method or the approach that can make the content same thing can happen or can be used, can be done in Malaysia. So um, because we, we don't actually focus in Malaysia's market, but our, our, our Facebook page managed to get 480K followers in within one year as well. So we believe that the same way can be done in both China and also Malaysia. So I think this is uh, a brief introduction about my me and my brother, and our account is called Malaysian Cousin. Okay, I pass to CK. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, next, uh, from a retail brand, uh, online retail brand without a physical store, right? Um, CK, maybe you would like to um, you know, enlighten us uh, or let us have a peek of how you start the, uh, the journey. Yeah, yeah I, I can only say because after listening what they do, really taiko la sifu for me. I can only claim myself more underwear and t-shirt than them. Other than that, I don't think I can claim anything. Uh, <clears throat> Oxfam, we started two and a half years ago. It's a very humble brand uh, based out in Malaysia. Uh, sell the world toughest product, which is the, the white shirt, you know, uh, our friend Kaiping is wearing. Uh, because at the time when we started, 99.9% .9 of the men's we survey don't buy shirt online. And forget about them buy shirt online and we sell at pre-order. That means the customer to, to, to pay it in advance for three months, then we make the shirt and deliver it to them. So it's the toughest sell ever, but then we make it happen. And we, we sold a few thousand shirts within the first uh, few hours. Uh, that's how we started. And today, Oxford is a lifestyle brand that help Asian people uh, looks good and feel good and and we pivot from selling just white shirt to more casual products and we have product for everyone yeah uh, from from every age of the uh, on the floor uh, our best selling product you know joke aside is really underwear uh, <laughs> because we we all dress differently but then what you know uh, in cycles uh, we have that bonding yeah uh, so so uh, I think Oxwhite always believe you know why we have to pay so much more for quality and the world best factory are located within ASEAN region and and we are have the factory that the best produce for us in this region 
and through our direct-to-consumer business model, uh, we, we make the best product from this factory in this region and sell to you directly and you enjoy the best price for the best quality you can get from, from this brand. So, so we are uniquely Asian and we are probably that a brand that started from Malaysia that we can empower through the e-commerce and, and sell you the best product at the best prices. Thank you. Uh, thank you, CK. CK is always uh, very humble. Uh, I met him a few times, uh, you know. Um, so, um, and he has always wanted to share with us about his experience. And of course, uh, we'd like to, as a uh, moderator, I should like to thank our organizer again, uh, Afim Bank, together working with uh, my organization, CDAC, and support by AWS and uh, MPI generally uh, for organizing this event uh, for the record uh, total sake of uh, live stream. <laughs> anyway, um, I think uh, I'll go back to Jen. Uh, maybe you can uh, share with us what's the uh, trend of MarTech now and mm -hmm. where should we uh, focus on? What, what, what's the future? Yeah. Uh, sure. I think contrary to popular belief, right, many people think the future of MarTech is really things like AI, big data, metaverse like you briefly talked about earlier. But if you look at where the industry is leading towards, where the mass population is heading to, we realize that these are none of the things. Right? Why I say that is because when you look at, sure, AI is cool, big data is cool, metaverse is cool, right? But there are a lot of limitations and a lot of hurdles for the mass business, uh, talking about people within this room, SMEs, micro entrepreneurs, to get to a certain level of mass adoption before things can actually happen. I mean, think about it, right? Just within this room, I'm pretty confident that there are a good number that don't really understand what big data really is yet. What is AI, right? We've probably heard of these terms. Maybe you're more familiar with metaverse because you've seen videos and all that. But how many of you have VR headsets at home? How many of you tried Oculus Rift before? How many of you can go on something spinning and you don't get dizzy? Right? I cannot. Uh, until we solve certain things like that, certain trends like this are cool to look at but not exactly the immediate things that we need to invest our time and effort upon. So coming back to the original question, if this is not what it is, what is it then? Now, very interestingly, right, if we had this event right before COVID, my answer would be totally different. You know why? Because these two years actually greatly changed and challenged how us as consumers behave using digital channels. Just think about it, right? The amount of time we spend on social media, on our tech devices, it has not just doubled or tripled, but for certain tools like Instagram, right, 16 times increase of engagement. TikTok grew more than 10 times in Malaysia, the usage during this period of time, which only equals to one word, content. The thing about content marketing, it is nothing new. It's probably not sexy at all. Some of you may hear, ah, yeah, this guy, Jen, you know, talk so long at the end, say content marketing. I, of, I already know this, right? But the difference of what's happening with content marketing right now, you have seen the evolution of how brands are approaching content. Prior to COVID, right, the content are still very informational. Brands can pass off as producing content as just you trying to inform your customers of what you are doing. It's always one way, it's very transactional, it's very just promotions driven. But what we have went through these past two years, uh, consumers have seen to want a lot more engagement and human interaction with the brand. They want to know who are the people behind it. Why are you doing certain things? Do you have a social cause? Do you have a human side to the brand or not? Are you just informing me things? Or are you trying to work with me, understanding my needs? Or are you just trying to sell to me. This changed the entire game uh, because we also have seen how the role of marketers, I don't know how many of you are marketers here today, but the role of marketing is slowly shifting to become an educator role. And it's very different because a marketer's role is just about awareness, it's all about conversion. But an educator's role is a lot of understanding, it's a lot of helping you understand what are your real problems? How can we solve? What are the solutions out there? And that's why you see the rise of content creators. Right? That's why you see content creators like himself and so many others. Right? It's, it's an era of content creators. Not because it's easy, 
But because us as consumers, all of us in this room are first consumers, we desire such a content. Just think about it, right? Right before this session, this morning or around the weekend, what kind of content do you consume? Do you consume branded content that tries to sell you things and try to give you informational breakdown? Or are you consuming content like perhaps something like what he's doing? Yeah. Right? Something that's more educational, something that's more entertainment. You take something, you learn something out of it. There's a huge difference of how we consume content today. And if you ask me the trend moving forward, it's how brands are able to humanize their communication into a personal level that we accept as consumers rather than just pushing it onto us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the you know, very insightful uh, sharing. Okay. Um, then, Edison, how do you produce uh, you know, an attractive, uh, you know, uh, so-called good uh, content. content. How, how do you, you know, you, uh, uh, yes, uh, we talk about trends, right? Yeah. And then how do you really produce it, create it, okay. you know? And, and what, what's your benchmark? Okay. First of all, I totally agree with one, what Jen mentioned just now. It's about, everything is about content. Just about this era is, the, the content is available since um, last time ago. It's just how the distribution way of, Last time we have the mass media like TV or the newspaper and then now uh, previously we have Facebook, Blogspot and then now we have TikTok, we have TikTok it's, but it's, it's still about content itself it's just the, 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 the method of how it distributes and then come back to the way how we create the content itself because you, you can, if you can know that the China market in, in China platform like towing itself is very competitive the, it's not only the individual or a single KOL they are doing the they are doing the content itself because uh, two years ago I visited to Beijing uh, one of my friends are working there so out of two hundred KOL they will have they have around thousand thousand people just to manage two hundred KOL so five person they are handling one KOL so they have the producer it's it's like I'm making a movie, but in the form of like just now Jen mentioned, it's a form of educational way. It's not like really hard sell. Hard sell. For example, if uh, Jen, uh, Jen is a is a cyclist, he likes to cycling a lot, and then every day on TikTok, he just posts on how the journey on how he's cycling from A to B, and then he share or he he are using what tires or what carbon or what anything and then eventually the followers comes it's all about like um his his favorite which is cycling so out of five thousand or one uh 10k followers it's all about the cycling so from there he can actually doing the ads about the bicycle or about the everything about the bicycle so from the the content itself because actually we learn a lot from china side and then the in Every platform, they have a different way of the mechanism, how to actually to attract the traffic. For example, if Facebook um, or the, we say TikTok, the first three seconds is very important. So because it's, um, it's we, we call it's a suggestion, or we call, how, how do you say the Attention, line? you grab the attention. Line. Yeah, yeah, we have to grab the attention like in between three or five seconds. Is it? this content is relevant to me. If for example, a machi, they, they scroll and then they saw my content is about cycling. Of course, he or, or she will actually scroll, scroll to, to the other content because she is not interested in, in the cycling content. She is more uh, interested in the cooking content. So the first three seconds for, for in, in order to attract the machi is like how to make a nasi lemak feel uh, uh, taste good so if the catchy if the catchy uh, the the title can catch them and then the content itself will get a more like more interaction and then all those things so from from the from the way we started the account we, actually we don't have any resources honestly and then we just everything we just start from zero i think if we can, if we can do it i think most of us in this hall can do it for example we have a video 
is shooting about the nasi lemak of Malaysia. So the cost of making that video, perhaps like three nasi lemak bungkus, maybe cost about five ringgit. But for that video itself, we actually gain about 10 million views in China. So you can see that out of five ringgit, you eventually you get exposure of 10 million. Unlike if you do posting, if you do boosting in Facebook itself, how much would it cost to get a 10 million views? So what we are saying that is a good, a really good content can actually help you to get a traffic and then eventually that traffic can convert to sales or to your private uh, members or private uh, subscription or anything. Yeah, this is uh, the experience based on what we are doing. Yeah, talking about competition, right? Um, I, I, I believe also I must have a lot of competitors nowadays. Uh, overseas, uh, local, everyone trying to mimic uh, whatever you do. So uh, the question to CK is how do you stand up, uh, uh, showcase your USP, uh, unique selling point, stand up from, from the rest of people? You know, um, how do you do it? I think from very basic, uh, outside is very kiasu and oh. sometimes kiasi also. So every <coughs> product we try to sell, although we very minimalist in terms of design, there's no, like the, the polo shirt I'm wearing, the jeans I'm wearing, it's like, obvious you can't spot it, it's an ox uh, But every way that we can, from packaging, from the boxes, uh, from a cart, uh, they always tell why we do certain things. So t-shirt, it will say why we developed the t-shirt uh, from a physical card to online. We tell a lot of story about why we developed this product uh, and how we can make it better. So the storytelling part has been always the, the strong point of Oxway, uh, telling people. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, the, the market don't need another brand, apparel brand. There's no yeah. need, right? Yeah, but, but how we can make it better is like, from our angle, how we can we develop a better products, and then we, we share this story to people. So, like what he uh, mentioned, Eddie is like, you know, he he tell a story of nasi lemak, right? <clears throat> then we tell a story about a shirt, and then when people want to recommend Oxford shirt, uh, they not only can it's very good and it's very cheap or value for money, but why it's good, right? So uh, a lot of details and attention, or always you can see from Oxford right? from website until the uh, detail in each product packaging. I think that is the key detail. Okay, thank you. Details, right? And I, I think I want to go back to Jen. Um, top, I, because I think the digital economy believes in growth, scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, and then uh, scaling is always, uh, we're talking about the, the terms of blitz scaling. So scaling is always a, a huge challenge because uh, uh, staff retention, and then also the pressure towards the founder itself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, psychology. I think if you nowadays there's a new two new drama coming out uh, about Uber and also WeWork uh, about the failure of the the kind of pressure, enormous pressure uh, suffered by the you know founders. Uh, I I think uh, maybe Jen, you want to uh, you know. I'll talk about how do you scale the, the, the kind of uh, how do you handle the pressure, uh, retain staff, handle your board member, <laughs> your investor. I think that that's the that's the uh, forever topic, right? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I, I mean, as you can guess from the question, my answer is going to be is to say that it's definitely not easy going through this process, right? I mean, ten years sounds long, but at the same time, it's like a blink of an eye. We have seen people that come and go. And I think one of the biggest pressure that's always uh, consistently upon us is actually less of the pressure of performance. <laughs> now, many people think that when you go into business, of course, performance is important, right? But then people would put their attention, oh, yeah, maybe you should earn more money and then that will solve all your problems. But the pressure actually comes more from the perception of the environment that we operate in. Because this whole in this startup industry, right, somehow a lot of us have this preconception of what a startup company is supposed to be. Right? Maybe some of you imagine it should look like Facebook. We need to give freebies. You need to be very free. You want to come to office, you don't want to come to office. 
you want to work, you don't want to work, you know. There's this very free culture in mind and that's where it breeds a very huge gap between imagination and reality. And that's a problem because that means that every time when we interview somebody, uh, especially fresh grads when they've been growing up with all this media, right, they read all these articles, they watch all these YouTube videos and they come, oh yes, start up, you know. And then they come and say, hey, why like normal company only one? And when that reality sets in, right, that opens up a lot of uh, different per new perceptions being made. One, that we start looking at the bigger tech companies. We they go to people like Grab, they go to directly to Facebook, they go to Google, they go to all these different bigger companies because that of these biggest companies projecting matches this imagination, mm. right? So that means what? That is a huge brain drain from the SME industry. The whole SME market losing people to this group of people because of that mismatch of expectation, right? Number two, then also brings up the second challenge of these people coming in then and then they think a startup is supposed to behave in a certain way and when they go in, when they experience it, uh, when it mismatch, they drop out because of their talent, because of expectation when it comes to salary, because of the jobs requirement, the demand, many look at startups as a place where they can have fun and enjoy their passion. Some of you that are in startups and working for startups or is a founder of a startup, you realize that startup means you work 10 times longer, 100 times harder. 10,000 hours, right? 10,000 hours. And that goes even to the employees. And many of them, when they join, right, they don't see this part of the picture. And then they start questioning, what, where is work-life balance, our boss? You know, why, why is it that weekends I need to work? Why is it, you know, I, I tell you, this is honest, right? So just two weeks ago, a candidate came and uh, we asked the candidate, so what are the things that you don't want to see in a company, right? That is part of our interview questions, right? And this candidate came and said, uh, I don't want to work overtime. Okay, like, common, right? How many of us, I know a lot of us don't want to work overtime if possible, right? So it's fine. So ask, what do you mean by overtime? Okay, so he said, oh, because in my previous company, we work overtime a lot. But we said, okay, does it mean that you need to work on weekends? No, we don't need to work on weekends. Okay, so what's overtime? Oh, almost every day, uh, instead of five, we go home at seven. And that to him is a huge stress and he doesn't want to be in a startup environment that gives him that again. Now, I'm not sharing this experience to bring down the next generation of people looking for jobs. Pe different people have different preference and expectations, right? I respect that. But that is where the misconception takes place and that makes it a lot more challenging to hire and retain people uh, as long as this common mindset floating around uh, within the job market. So when we scale, right, I think for a company, it becomes very important to focus on the type of candidates that suit your organization's culture. That attraction point needs to match what your candidates is. So that means it's no longer just on a skill basis. It's about alignment of what the candidate is looking for and what can you provide. That means the change of how we interview. That's how, that's the change of the language of the company. That means that how we attract candidates on certain platforms. All this needs to be addressed very more upfront. Not so much of a surprise coming and ta-da, this is how we run. And then we still go through probation program. I think that has also changed over the years. So you watch all these uh, exciting uh, YouTube video about startup, but then tell the reality check is that we are a boring company. <laughs> yeah, because these YouTube videos don't show you what happens behind the scenes, right? The hard work they don't show. They always pan all oh, the pantry, all the food, look at the lifestyle, people walking around, nice office space, and they come in like that only. Uh. You know, <laughs> and then that's where problem starts. Okay. Um, uh, next question, I would like to pose to CK. I, uh, you, you have uh, three types of bosses. One is the uh, customer, and then your staff, and then your investor. How do you consistently uh, manage your expectation, keep them happy, and then uh, you not only retain but also make them happy or convince with your direction? Oh. Uh, <clears throat> each of these three, I think for Oxfam, uh, we need to manage differently. Uh, I'm, we, we have 485 uh, investors that invested in us through the pitching 
uh, crowdfunding. So we are the technically the largest today. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy, uh, but to 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 the investor side, I would say uh, the company that raise fund to this kind of platform must be clearly exhibit the expectation from early days. Uh, a very much common question people ask us is like, you know, when you're going to go listing, when you're going to be profitable, mm -hmm. when you're going to bring all swipe overseas and grow your revenue to how many X. I think that we need to manage as, uh, very well. Uh, from from very first day, we never tell them we're going to go listed. Mm -hmm. uh, we will, of course, explore every opportunity. Uh, in terms of customers' expectation, I think in between what is important is to build the trust. Um, uh, for us, we are investing a lot of resources to make sure that uh, our customers are actually happy. So you can go and try, buy something for Oxfam and tell them you're not happy with your product. Probably my, my staff will tell you, keep the products and then we will give you the full refund or we will exchange for you and you still keep the products. So, of course, uh, to a very small percentage, people will ask, you know, how about customer will misuse it? Yes, there will be small, but then again, with, with the goodwill that Oxford has built over the years, I think that pay off. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, when we just started to sell white shirts online, uh, part of our way to gain customer trust uh, to buy is to offer 365 days, no question asked return or exchange policy. At the time, four years ago, not many Malaysian company dare to say that, and, and, and that is the policy. Guess what, a year on, we have less than 0.5% of people actually exchange a return to us. So that speaks a lot about uh, you know, good customers. Yeah, of course we have a fair share of customers, right? But then it's, it's so small, but because of we offer something extraordinary, they open up to a lot of customers like you support us. Otherwise, you will not support us, right? Uh, and, and for employees, uh, Jen is one of my good mentors. I actually consulted him how to make customers, uh, our employees happy. He has a very good uh, policy in place to walk well employees. Uh, we learning part of it. I think we attract, no, no, sir, we did attract. Mm. Uh, we like to hire young talents uh, that without experience, so we can groom them in terms of the mindset and how we do things. Uh, a lot of time when we hire, we hire based on value, based on culture. Uh, that is another topic we don't talk all day long. But it's, it's more like, is the people you like working with or not? Right? A lot of time when we make decision, or I entrust my team to make a decision, is based on the common sense. Right. But common sense to people are different from one person and another. So, so to hire a, a good team to have that common sense, uh, we, must like, we must like the person first. So uh, every channel is different. Uh, I try to you know, sit in the interview uh, as we can. So I, I will get the sense of the person, whether I, I like to hang out or not. If not, even if it's very talented, I will give it a miss. So okay. every channel is different. So customer service, we are very demanding. Until today, there are people still write to me through the Facebook, Instagram, asking questions when you will stop this. And I will take time to reply. And when we send out newsletter to to few hundred thousand customers, certain newsletter, for example, a notification of price increase, that was sent out from my email, not from my general email. So anyone can reach out to me. So uh, that is what it showed to build the trust between the customers and us. So every level is different. Thank you. There's a, there's a story about Steve Jobs that actually he replied almost every email. Mm, yes. Uh, like, so that, the, yeah, that, that, that's a saying in the Silicon Valley. Right. Um, so Edison, um, yeah. I mean, you, you must be, there's a lot, you must be a lot of comparison, right? Um, you you com compete with, uh, you are in the most competitive market, you compete with the uh, talents from China, mm -hmm. and then also locals, right? Everyone is also trying to do the same thing. Yeah. So how do you maintain that balance? I mean, 
of course, uh, people will also, um, we, we also have a fair share of number, maybe 50% of the people are, are very negative, you know, uh, criticizing and uh, uh, kind of thing. So how do you handle it and also keep on coming up with your brands of content, which is uh, at the highest level? Uh, if you say it's at the highest level, I think from our ability, I would say like it's uh, highest level. But if we are compared to the China market, I think we just like a, a small potato, <laughs> really, really. <laughs> because there's a, a minimum like 500, uh, 5 million, 10 million, that's a lot of KOL in, in China. So mm. it's very, in, in, if in China, we are just a small potato. But in Malaysia itself, it's, uh, it's seldom you can see like uh, the KOLs like us is more focuses on the Malaysian, Malaysian content because um, it's, it's kind of tough actually to actually promote uh, Malaysia because out of these two years we are trying to promote Malaysia you, we, we find out a lot of the tourism spot is um, not really fancy or attractive compared to Thailand or compared to the the, the other ASEAN country and then also the street food itself. So we, we already cover like in, in Penang, we already, I think cover more than 20 or 30 kind of street food and we are out of, uh, out of idea or on <laughs> what to, to, to do the content anymore. So, so it's kind of hard for us, but compared to the street food in Thailand or the island or the point of attraction in Thailand, we can find out or they, they, there's always a lot of things to do. So, um, the, we found out also the China people, they also like about um, more, more about Thailand compared to Malaysia. So, it's, it's very tough for us, the first thing. The second thing is about the, our culture and our ethnic. Our ethnic. Because uh, in China itself, they are very sensitive on this ethnic issue, especially like um, they are, their issue between the, the China and the Western part. The Western part is more like, more towards uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic state. And then it's a very sensitive issue. So every time if we shoot about um, uh, our um, is Islam issue or the religious. religious thing, they kind of ban us to promote in their platform. So it's kind of passive for us to actually can fully cover on Malaysian. So sometimes if we do live, and then we eventually we, we shot uh, our, our friend Malay girl as anything, or, and, or speak Malay, and then they will just cut off our live show. Okay. Or they will just block our video. So it's very tough for us. So we just um, pray to God. So we just do the best, just do whatever we can to provide value and provide the help to Malaysia, hopefully after the pandemic, after um, China can come in, hopefully our video can bring uh, a lot of China tourists coming in and hopefully can benefit all the industry in Malaysia. This is our, our main intention, firstly. And then, um, just now you mentioned about how to keep the videos in quality. So now we are in the midst of uh, taking in people coming in into our, into our company, our, our workplace. So now we have around 10 person, but in Malaysia, if you want to actually look for content industry, content creator industry, they are, they are pro in script writing or, or anything. It's, it's kind of hard because it's very new in Malaysia actually to focus us in just content creating. It's very hard. So we have to hire the fresh grade. So in, in, in our, our group, in our work workspace, it's more about Gen Y. The youngest will be 2002, I think, the youngest. And the eldest, I am the eldest, of course. And the eldest should be 98, 1998. So the, the year gap is very young. And then I have to create a really cheerful and joyful environment for them. So I don't actually do like, uh, just now what you mentioned. <laughs> This is very hard for them because if, if in a very straight or very tight um, working space, they will, it's, it's kind of limit their creativity. Yep. 
So I have to create a, a really fun environment for them to actually have a good idea for that. So for me, uh, I don't mind if my account been, been, been destroyed by them. For me, it's like I, I hope that everyone come in in my, in, my, in my workspace, you have the opportunity to learn. So if I, I hire, let's say for five person, so every person they will have their own, their own template. They, they should, they, they, they write the script and then they should, and then they, they edit and then they post. After that, you do the feedback so on uh, what is the result. And then after that, you, imp you improve, the, you improvise. And then if the plan A doesn't work, and then you go for plan B. So of, out of five staff there, they, they are doing their own thing. So I have, to, I, I'm giving a lot of um, gap for them to actually improve. Yeah, this is how we keep the content really goes on. Yeah. Um, Jen, maybe in a quick uh, summary, mm -hmm. um, how to become a good and influential MarTech company? Wow. Uh. <laughs> to short and brief some more. Short and brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, what's the key ingredient? I think um, one of the main things is, especially when we are talking about content marketing, that being the trend for what yeah. I think the key thing is to build your own personal credibility. I think that's one part of marketing where a lot of companies fail to realize its importance. They always focus on awareness, but awareness does not necessarily equal to credibility. So I leave that here because credibility for every business in different industry could mean different things. For some, let's say for him, it could be uh, the number of views, the number of followers, that could be credibility. That may not mean anything to you, right? Let's say your company's corporate video get 1 million views, it may not mean anything to you, but you may have different criteria surrounding your business. And uh, the idea here is that for you as a company or you doing a freelance or whatnot, to find ways to ask yourself, what is the definition of credibility of my business to my customer? If you can start listing out those things and to build upon those few areas, uh, that would already establish what you have just said. Okay. CK, mm. what's, the, what's your prediction of the next big thing of a retail business? Um, omni-channel, or, or some, some retail uh, from online, now they start to open up shops in um, or offline, or the omni-channel, the offline guys going online. So, so what, what's the next, next big, big trend? Mm -hmm. I, I would say, for what I know, yeah, because I only sell online, I don't have a retail shop now, but it should be in the ideal state, is whereby uh, we should know who comes into you, to your shop, even to the venue today. Like for example, if today work is the event organizer like host for this space, uh, for work, I mean this co-working space, they should know all of you that has came here before. Right? Now it's only the organizer have it. After the event, tap out the name list, go back home, bye bye, thank you very much. Nobody knows. Like I mean Today, you go to the popular coffee chain from the US, they still ask you your name, what drinks you want. Even you go there every single day, same time, same drink, they will still ask you, you know. So this, this should, shouldn't be, right? So for, for me, the idea of Oxford one day to be as simple as you come into my store, I know you what you bought before, and I'm there to, to, to not to sell you, I mean to, to let you try on the new products and, and to, to, to chat house the product that you have purchased before. So Oxwhite, we managed in a very short three and a half years, grow to 800,000 customers. And we have a retention means, uh, repeat customers of 60% who come back and buy from us. It's because we know the customer well. And we have evolved so many ways from using Facebook Messenger to communicate with you then we realized the younger generation now don't use Facebook. So we on board to uh, you know, platform messaging. But now today, you go to oxwhite.com, you will probably see this uh, WhatsApp icon there. And, and we will communicate with you the way you like to be communicated. So even it costs us a bomb for every single thread or message we pay. But then this is the trend. 
So we want to make sure that we are at the forefront of, of, of able to communicate. Yeah. So, so any way they can find us, chat with us, there's always a way. So for me, uh, must be customer centric. I, I, I don't know what could be the next big things or like, like um, AWS, what they promoted is, is a big, big thing. I'd love to have it one day in our store. But then we go back to the basic, right? Uh, to, to able to have customers connect with us all the time. Thank you. Okay, that, 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 that's the most crucial part. Um, Edison, maybe yeah. just uh, advice. How to be successful in TikTok <laughs> within uh, three seconds? Three seconds. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, be I believe um, this topic might be uh, very uh, interesting for, for all of you. Um, most of the SME, they are struggling on from offline, we say digital marketing from offline to online, but uh, we, we, we no, no longer say digital marketing nowadays, we say uh, content marketing. So um, a, a quick, a quick uh, introduction on how to do a, a good TikTok is if you are selling a nasi lemak, you can actually have a TikTok account. Because previously, every company before the Facebook coming, you, you only have website or even you don't have a website. So after Facebook coming or oh, everybody's, every business are going to Facebook, you have your own Facebook page, you have your own uh, Instagram page. It's just about doing the blog posts on photos and written, written articles, that's it. But nowadays the Gen Y are more towards, more towards to watching a video, short video or even medium, medium length video. So TikTok, the platform is very, it's very, I, I would say it's very, how to say, it's very nice for everyone, even though you don't have followers, just, just started your account. But if your content is very nice, you can go viral, even though you are just a, a, a nobody because of your, your content and how the mechanism of TikTok being calculated and, and push your video to the public. So just a quick on the mechanism itself. Okay, every video posted on TikTok will have a free 500 view. So out of the 500 view itself, it will calculate one like will be how many score, uh, score maybe one, one, one mark, one point, and then one comment will be how many points, and then one share will be how many points. If out of the, the, the first poll, 500 views, you get the, you get the, 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 I would say minimum criteria to hit the next 1,000 view and then it will open up the next pool for you. So out of the 1,000 view pool, if you manage to hit the 5,000 5, view pool and then you open again. So it's very fair, fair for everyone who want to create the content. And the TikTok shop already been, been, been launched in Malaysia. And I believe this is a, a very good opportunity for all to actually uh, look at it because it's very, you can just use a very minimal cost to try it because everyone has smartphone right now. You can shoot any videos you like and then post on it, post on it and then you can have a shot. And then eventually in this, I, I will see that in these five years, a lot of Gen Y will move from Shopee or Lazada, oh, sorry, the, to, to, to TikTok itself because TikTok is more like, it's, it's more driven like interest, we, we would say interest commerce, interest commerce. So we, you, if you follow the, if you follow the KOL, it's more about, just now I said cycling, and then the shop itself is more sell about the bicycle, the tire, and then the helmet, everything, and then you will buy from him. It's not like just going to Lazada or Shopee to scroll or what you want to buy, whatever, no. It's about oh, what content do you see, and then, oh, this bike I like so much, and then you just tap on it on his 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 profile, and then you straight away you can buy from it. So it's, it's I think it's a new trend coming in, yeah, because it's happening in Thailand and in Indonesia. So Malaysia just starting. So I believe I hope uh, if you have you are doing the business uh, SME, this is a good opportunity for us to join now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean for those that are interested to check out what he said, right? That's entertainment commerce. Yeah. It's a huge yeah. thing within the region, uh, especially for small players uh, yeah, small moving players. forward. It's, yeah. it's amazing. The amount of consumption and entertainment commerce, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Check that out if you're interested.
Okay, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, all three of our speakers. I think they, they share wonderful insight about the, uh, the journey um, you know, on the digital economy. Um, uh, I would like to thank Jan, Edison, and also CK. So uh, feel free to uh, interact with them uh, afterwards and uh, before we go to the next session. And again, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Afim Bank and this uh, event. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, panelists.